Hi, everybody. Well, I have a very special, very special uh, 25th anniversary chat today with Kimberly McCullough and Michael Sutton. And we're here because we are um, celebrating, well, in a way, this iconic moment of Stone's death, which was 25 years ago, uh, which is hard for all of us to even fathom. The episode aired on November 29th, uh, 1995. And here we are 25 years later, and it still resonates with everybody that has watched daytime television or television is one of the most heartbreaking, memorable, um, and important moments in daytime television history. And Kimberly and Michael were such a huge, they, they did these scenes, they brought the story to life on the screen so beautifully. And thank you both so much for doing this. I know the fans will just love seeing you both. First of all, I guess I would say, how are you, Kimberly? Hi, thanks for having me. I'm good. I'm really, really good. I'm happy that this year is almost over. And when's the last time you saw <laughs> Mr. Sutton? Oh my gosh, maybe, maybe when we did the scene together? <laughs> was that it? That was like stuff Back in the, in the well? well? Every once in a while on like social media or something, I'll say hello or make a comment or something, but no, I mean, even this is, you know, remotely and digitally and electronically, but I haven't yeah. seen him in person for a long it's time. So crazy. I think that was, yeah, somehow you Benjamin buttoned and gone back. <laughs> 11 year old you've been buttoned but um yeah it's been a really long time I don't I I guess I was in my 20s I want to say maybe I don't know I don't know it was a really long time ago it's great it's great to see you and it's great to see you Michael both of you so well, great to see you and how are you Michael how have you been holding up through this pandemic um as best as I can I mean we're just all getting through it surviving um new wrinkles, new shutdowns, new, it's just new, 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 and we all got to get used to it, but we're doing our part and masking up and trying not to, you know, be around too many people and social distance and all, all that stuff, but it's tough. We're, you know, lonely, bored, uh, you know, luckily I have my wife and my partner in crime, but I mean, we're alienated from the world and it's, it's wild. Well, I wanted to first start, you know, Kimberly, you wrote uh, such a beautiful thing. I just wanted to, uh, you know, you, you went on social media and you said how important this moment was to you. You said 25 years ago today, I experienced what would become my finest moment as an actor. My character, Robin Scorpio, lost her first love, Stone Cates, to AIDS. And you went on to say that the love that poured through us that day was a reflection of the best of us. When we can see through the prejudice, and the fear of a disease and treat the person experiencing deterioration with compassion. Um, telling stories can be a vehicle for enlightening and yes, even soap operas can change the world. I believe we did that with the story of Robin and Stone and I thought that was so beautifully said. Um, so I, I have to say to you, what do you recall about the pressure of, you know, this was gonna be the scene, he's going to die. You guys have to play the scene did you feel an enormous amount of pressure that day? What I remember is not pressure. I remember like this bubble of love. Um, I remember Francesca James holding my hand. I remember Michael being um, like really zen that day. <laughs> um, I remember everyone on the set like losing it every single scene it was like all you could hear was like <laughs> like you know every time we would cut um it just felt like this circle of love and this culmination of um all of this sort of hard work that we had done up until that point and uh and just feeling relieved almost that it was it was gonna be over you know and then just really trying to be present and enjoy the last moments of this story. Michael, and you had to literally lay there. So, you know, <laughs> what, what was what was just incredible about this was, so you do the, the, the iconic moment, I see you, Robin, I see you, which is just beyond heartbreaking. 
and you guys play that moment, and then he's he dies. Can I go get you something to eat, okay? Go stand by the window in the light. about having to lay there after I was exhausted so I mean I think it was rather easy at that point because I just I was spent um, Kimberly will tell you I mean every day was just an emotional gut wrenching just reaching down to the base of like our core and we did it almost willingly but automatic because we were so in character talk about method acting i mean we were living our our roles and um because of that uh i like kimberly so eloquently wrote we we just reached this plateau of just love and enlightenment and um i think we were just we were there in in a moment that we knew was bigger than us and you know I, I was older than Kimberly, but still very young myself. So neither one of us were really ready to process life and death and what it all means and our purpose here and how we can affect other people and giving into love and sort of the things that we can wrap our heads around now, you know, to play that at that age and that moment in time, we didn't really have life experiences to grab onto. So we were just winging it and it was just, um, like they say, like some kid actors can just use their imagination. We were using our imagination and we were just so tapped into it that Kimberly and I were on a different wavelength in those scenes. We just, when we got there, I looked in her eyes, she looked in mine and we trusted each other that it was about to happen. You know, we just knew it was going to happen. It wasn't like we were going to reach for it. And it wasn't going to be there. Our emotions were there every time we needed it. Even if we had to do it 10 times and sometimes we did. Um, and it was, it was pretty um pretty special it was amazing michael it was amazing i mean i went back after everybody after kimberly said that and i and, and we all communicated and you know i went back and watched it and you just break down crying because it's just the most beautifully it's just the perfectly it's, it's a perfect scene you know almost it's like and the performance is michael your eyes is welling up with tears when she's there and sure at the window and then the whole thing, it was so beautifully, it was actually beautifully choreographed in a way, you know what I mean? By how they staged it, shot well, Francesca it. directed it. Francesca directed it. Yeah. Um, you really had, it really said what Kimberly did, the magnificence of soap opera was right there. Like that was it in that moment that you seldom see, you know? Yeah, and it was a moment but I think the reason why it made it so special is because we had already spent a year experiencing this with these characters. So it wasn't just like an episode of television. Right. <laughs> the end of a long road. Right. You know, it's funny being at COVID and watching a lot of TV <laughs> and amazing <laughs> TV right now, we're, we're all on, on this hiatus. 
um, the quality of work is so impressive. And you know, when I binge watch these shows and I watch, let's say, 30 episodes of something, and I realize now why soap operas hit home like they did, having you know gone through this experience now as just a fan. Because when you can watch it consecutively, like you know, the format of a daytime soap opera was so unique back then to do this, I feel quality of work on that platform or format is difficult because the material is so fresh to the actors that it's tough to really engage at that level when you're getting a script every day that you're having to do 60 pages a day. But we were so in sync that the five day week, we were, we were blazing through it. And we actually told a story that we could go and watch Netflix right now. They did a you know beginning A to Z of our storylines. I mean, it was consistent, it would hold through. I mean, we were right there. And I think that, um, that that's why people are gravitating towards TV and being able to tell a story in not two and a half hours, but you know, in 16 weeks or you know, seven, seven seasons. Um, and I think that's what we sort of did back then in a weird way, you know? Did you watch it back? Did you remember back then when you were 25 years ago when it aired, did you watch it? Did you watch your work back? Like when did you first see the episode? Did you ever watch it? <laughs> um, very, I would, I would tape some of the scenes because I just wanted to make sure that what I felt didn't go right, I wanted to improve on. But I really had a hard time watching myself. So I would do it to just say, was I right that that didn't come across the way that I would have wanted it? It was very hard on myself at, at, at that time. Um, but that's why I watched it back. But the moment that really hit me was there was some soap opera event and there was a big screen and we were all in the room and they played the clip of the, the moment in the, in the motel room, Kimberly, when I have to say like, don't touch me because I, I was bleeding yeah. and I, I'm, I'm HIV positive. And that was on the big screen. And when I saw that, I was like, oh my God, this is real. That, that's when it hit home to me. Like this storyline is as heavy and intense as I think it is. And I stopped being a critic and judgmental. And I just, just was like, I'm in it. So let's just go. Yeah, so, your commitment was insane. Was it? I bet. So intense. Yeah. We were on it. Kimberly, do you remember when they came to you? Obviously, they came to you and said how Robin was going to be the vehicle to tell this story. In, in sort of, you know, there was the HIV AIDS story, Joan dies, she's going to live on being HIV positive. When you heard this, like what do you remember of finding out about it and what- I remember when uh, Wendy brought me in her office and she sat me down she's like, look, I'm gonna give you a very important grown up storyline. And, um, told me a little bit about it. At that point, they didn't know if Robin was actually going to contract HIV. They just knew that there was gonna be a scare and that her boyfriend Stone would eventually develop into um, full-blown AIDS. And I didn't honestly know a lot about it then, which is kind of where we started off on this journey to um, this after school special that we did where Michael and I both talked to a bunch of um, AIDS patients um, to educate ourselves. And then at the same time, Wendy sent me to John Homa, the acting coach who was like very well known for making, you know, young people movie stars at the time. <laughs> and, um, he like changed my life. He completely changed the way I thought about acting. And he kind of became our godfather and, and guided us through this whole experience. At first he was just working with me. And then it became, he was like the keeper of Robin and Stone. It was amazing. 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 Michael, do you, where do you, what, did they tell you originally when you were coming on, this was going to happen when you were cast on the show or this happened you felt no, it, it happened um, sort of after the first year. I think they were still trying to figure out what was going to happen, you know, because I, I was now tied in with Sonny. I was tied in with Jagger. Um, and, you know, that was sort of like a pretty big storyline. Like that was, you know, that at that time. Uh, but when I was told that this was going to be the storyline, you know, 
I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I'm ready for this. You know, as great as like you, I mean, if you're on a soap opera, you want the storyline, you want the lead, you want it, you want to be that. But at the same time, I was not sure if I was prepared with the skill set to perform it. You know, um, I was a, you know, relatively new actor. I had gone to film school. I, I understood the process, but to get me to that point, I mean, if you told me I was going to have to do, you know, a crying scene and get very emotional, I would want to have a, a, an onion, you know, <laughs> get, get the fumes. Were and, those onions? I know those are onions. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like that, it, it would have scared me to the point where like, how am I going to do this? And I mean, I think that's where I, I always, you know, I, I, I always love the, the storyline that we did. And I always love Kim because we sort of met the challenge. You know, it was like this huge mountaintop and we were scared and we were like, oh my God, are we going to want to be the poster children for AIDS and all the rest that came with it? You know, it's a lot of, a lot of luggage. But um, what, what I think happens is this. I think they were so smart in picking... Um, a heterosexual young couple in love to tell the story. It was a great vehicle, much better than going with a homosexual storyline because then it's too niche. It's too um, easy for the audience at the time. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's what we've seen sort of, you know, in a totally different area and aspect is Black Lives Matter right now. We were on COVID. Everyone was finally like, wait, what is going on? We don't accept this. And as soon as the white mainstream people had enough time out in their lives to say, have we been letting this happen? Have we been blind to this? Have we been complicit to this? Oh my God, we're not going to allow this anymore. And then boom, it's like in a weird sense, the choice that the writers and the storytellers of GH made by going with the heterosexual cast, it opened it up to the mainstream. And once the mainstream was like, we're not going to accept this, then it broke it wide open. And then in a lot of ways, I feel like it's parallel. It's totally different. And I don't like, you know, people are going to beat me up for Black Lives Matter because it's its own thing. But I remember uh, just to to piggyback on that. I do remember several letters and several in-person meetings where fans would say um, my brother is gay and my parents haven't talked to him, you know, since he came out and he has AIDS. And this is literally the only reason they decided to talk to him, you know, like things like that. But that happened all the time. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that it, it opened up. That's why I use the word enlightenment. I was softly saying what you are specifically saying. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but Kimberly, they also, they knew in making Robin HIV positive, it was the girl, everyone's, you know, Robin was the fan favorite child. It was, you know, here she was. Anna's daughter. I mean, she was part of the fabric of the show. It was such a smart move that yes. they made her the character that would live with HIV when they decided to do that. Right. It was a was lot of correct decisions made. Um, and then, like you said, we were able to meet the challenge with a lot of support. I mean, the writing, Clara Levine's writing was incredible. You know, we had all the support we needed. It was still hard and scary. Um, but, you know, even now when you guys, when you're talking about it, it's like, I, I'm transported. I'm like beamed to that room on that stage. And I, I know exactly how I was feeling in every moment. And yeah. uh, it's sort of like frozen in time in a way. Kimberly, speaking of that, were you, like you knew this would be your last scene with Michael at that point, you know, when he died, right? Did you, wasn't that yeah. cool? Gut wrench. Well, it was really, it was like a death. It was, it was like a death. I know. <laughs> yeah. It was like the death of our on screen relationship. You know, it's yeah. a trip. It's like, even like, even if we don't see each other for a long time, it's, it's that connection is, it's there. It's, it's established. You can't move it. Like, it's, <laughs> it's yeah. real. You know, it's a trip. And what's been amazing, Michael, as a testament to the character and to you, is they have brought Stone back. You have made appearances. And every time you came back, and you know I've written this and, and talked about this, it's just been wonderful to see you. And you're always so great in the scenes and the emotions right there, the scenes with Maurice when he was going through his thing. 
when you were, when Stone was, you know, Robin's in a well and Stone comes to her and even those were heartbreaking. And, and I really say, you do have a handle on this character, Michael. <laughs> you could play him like it's, and yeah. we're all, and we're all, we all feel because it brings us back. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think Wendy Rich, you know, to give her a lot of credit, she said to me early on when I got cast, she said, you know, don't try to do a lot of character work that's not close to home because on a soap opera, you have to play this day in and day out find what's, you know, bring, bring a lot of you to the, to the role. It'll be easier, you know? Um, but when you don't really have a lot of, you know, acting chops, it's tough to just be yourself and do whatever on camera. It, that doesn't work either. But what I, I realized is, is that what I could bring was tapping into my, my emotions. And once that started to happen, I could find that at any time with Stone. So that's the click that happened for me. And it's really what Wendy was telling me was find it in you, don't look for it outside. And, and that's why it's always there when I go to it. And, 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 um, and, and the story meant something, you know, I knew we were doing great work. Kimberly was a thousand percent committed. Maurice back then, you know, was a thousand percent committed. Um, we tell the story a bunch of times with Maurice, but Maurice, you know, when we started, Maurice was like, all right, kid, you know, I'm going to do a lot of scenes with you. You're not that great. You know, it was that type of thing. And he engaged with me and he's like, but you, you, you have something and you're connecting with me. And he liked me, you know, we had a great friendship. So he's like, I'm going to teach you everything I know. And he goes, he goes, I said, I said, thank you for that. And I said, I hope to get where you want me to be and where I want to be. And I hope one day you're requesting scenes with me. And, <laughs> and at the end of the storyline, he had, come knocking on the, you know, my dressing room. And he said, well, it happened. I'm like, what happened? He said, well, I just went upstairs and I knocked on the door and I had to sit down with everybody. And I said, you know, you're not writing enough scenes with Stone and I, and Michael Sutton and I need to work more together and integrate me more with Kimberly and, you know, Michael. And, you know, because he was right there with us and he, 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 he was so integral in it. And, you know, the first day that we saw Maurice come with the chops of his, you know, pedigree from being on a soap 10 years before. I mean, we were like in awe because he killed it. And we were like, all right, we're going to learn from this guy. We want to do our scenes with this guy. And I think more than anything, you know, Kimberly and I really, I mean, we grew up with those, those roles because it demanded that of us, you know, it wasn't just fluff stuff and it wasn't just saying your lines. I mean, we needed to do something bigger and that's why I think we'll always be proud of it. And um, I think the fans will always connect with us. And we got, we got lucky that we were chosen to tell this story. You know, we're, I'm very blessed that it was Kimberly and I. Kimberly, you know, once Stone passed in that episode or when he died, then, it, then she has to, she calls Luke. She tells Tony Gear, I don't know if you remember the scene, she calls Luke and she calls him and says, I have to tell you, or, there's a moment where she talks to Luke that tells him that Stone passed. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah. And so you're, you know, you're telling him, I just want you to know Stone's dead. And he's on the other, you're not with him in the same room. He's, you know, so there's yeah. a great scene between the two of you. And then do you remember when Vanessa Marcel came and saw Stone was yes. dead on the bed, all of that? What do you remember about everybody else at that moment too? Now he's, how was that to play? She came in, Maurice was there. You're Honestly, there. it was like a blur. A blur. <laughs> it yeah. was a it was a blur. And like it's weird because at, at that point in my life, like Michael was saying, I hadn't had a lot of death experience. But when my father passed away, I was in the room with him and it felt very similar. It's like this like wash of love, and you can't really think or you're just sort of like in it. It's like a haze. Um, and that's what it felt like that day. It was just, it felt real. I don't know how else to explain it. And everyone else was just sort of peripheral. Like I, I was just, because Robin was so connected to stone, Robin was just with stone and everyone else was just sort of like dancing on the outside. My best friend died of AIDS and I was in the hospital. I'd gone to the hospital to be there and he had gone blind and he uh, it, it was so awful so then when I, it was a very close it was before this aired right Jeez. so i was already 
hear that had already gone through a yeah. death of you know and i it was just horrifying back then it was horrifying how they they were all in an, an aids ward and they weren't be taken care of properly. it was just so bad it was just so bad and i watched him pass away and um his family did come thank god i was worried like i didn't want him to die alone but he had family that came and it was really hard and that's why i want to commend you to because then i saw you guys do it and it you know it still felt i experienced how i experienced it and i think you guys did such a beautiful job of it whether you're gay straight or whatever at that point like you can you could relate to the situation yeah um did you when you left the show michael were you like were you like what am i doing now <laughs> what did you what was it like for you after all of this had happened and now you're not going back to the show right well the perspective that i had back then was like now i know i can act so i was like let's go i wanted another role like that and the problem is that was my role that that was the one you know, and, and I, I heard other people talk about it and they're like, you know, sometimes you only get one, sometimes you don't get any. And that was my role. Um, there's just not a lot of material. I'm, I'm not saying that it wouldn't be great to go be a superstar or be a movie star or do whatever, but not like that was the one that had all the meat and, and, and that was the one to perform and just showcase it, you know, it brought everything out. So um, I think that my attitude was like, well, where's that again? Let me do that, but on film, you know? Um, and uh, I did it, you know, I did a couple of films that were supposed to be bigger films and then a lot of the stuff got cut out and then it wasn't that big of a film. And then I did some stuff that was smaller stuff and that didn't get any exposure. So I was like, all right, it, that's out of my control now. You know, if I get another role, I know what I can do with it and we'll see. And, um, so yeah, I was excited at the time. I was like, let's go. What's the next bit of material? And Kimberly, Robin is iconic to the show. I mean, you must be so proud of the legacy of Robin. I mean, she is beloved. You are that person that played that character. And we're so- Yeah, I just feel yeah. so lucky. Like what Michael was saying, I just feel so lucky that we got that opportunity and that we did actually enjoy it. Well, enjoy it in like a masochistic kind of way, but. <laughs> right, you enjoyed the process. I'm sure you enjoyed getting to yeah. do this, even though it was difficult. Yeah, I mean, there's never been anything that I've done after that that has compared, you know, nothing. Like not even with, not even directing yet. I mean, I hope that it will, but. Did yeah. you know back then after when you, did you have any inkling back then? When did you know you were gonna wanted to be a director through any of this? Oh yeah. You were like, I, yeah. I was like, I'm spent. <laughs> <laughs> I don't wanna cry anymore. Yeah. I don't, I don't wanna cry. I mean, think about it. A film is what, a couple of months? If it's a studio film, maybe it's a little more. Independence, it's 18 days. It's like, you know, you're in and, in, you're in and out of a role. And if it's emotional, it's done in, a, in six weeks. This was like, you know, a year and a half or whatever it was in real time. I mean, we, we were really exhausted. And then, I mean, I remember one day, I think we had like 20 of the 24 scenes of the day. Oh, and God. I mean, when I think about what we just just put in our brains and just reiterated oh, and just got out of us. But I mean, one day I literally, there was this in that scene where it was like scene 19 of, of 21. <laughs> and for some reason, it was like, there was pre-tapes and post-tapes, which is like other episodes that we're shooting that day. Cause I think Antonio came back. And anyway, it was a, it was a nonsensical scene about making a hot fudge sundae. And for whatever reason, we had Joe, who was like the toughest director that just wanted us to hit our marks and say the lines word for word. And I, I just couldn't process anymore. And I was saying like, the cherry before the chocolate or the chocolate before the vanilla or the sprinkles <laughs> after the whatever. And I couldn't get it the way it was written on paper. And Joe like was like, cut, can we try that again? Michael, do you want to look at the copy? And I was like, I was like looking up at the boom going, Joe, are you serious? 
does it matter if the sprinkles or the cherry or the I just I I couldn't process anymore, you know? <laughs> and I was like, let me save the hard work for what I'm, I'm getting that right. You know, this this was and, and I remember he said, clear, moving on, which was the cue that, you know, they were accepting all the takes and whatever. And we were going to the next scene. But we just we couldn't sometimes, you know. Yeah, that's so funny. That's, Did I you have a that. moment like that, Kimberly, with anything where you're just like, I can't say another word. <laughs> I cannot. I just feel like I couldn't shed another tear. Like I just, I just, I just couldn't. If I shed any tears, I wanted them to be for me. <laughs> you had no tears for yourself. And you, it's like you cried, you're all cried out, right? Yeah. yeah. How, and how did you guys go home as young kids? Did you, you would leave the studio and how were you? God. Were you like, how did you get, like, what happens when you leave that day and be like, I got to go back and play the AIDS story tomorrow again? You, you had to go learn lines. That was the thing, though. So it was like, you, you were shooting or you were eating, sleeping or, or learning lines or, or repeating the lines. Because that, I mean, for me, at least, I didn't see a friend. I didn't, I didn't do anything. It was just, you know, you're living. I don't remember what I did. I, I, I remember just sleeping a lot. I just slept whenever I could. I, I was a huge like football. I played high school football. I loved football. You know, it was just one of those things that was part of my life. I just remember when I got on General Hospital to when I got off, I didn't know any of the players in the league anymore. So I was like, <laughs> oh, my God. I, oh my God. Cause I, I, Sundays I was learning my lines. I wasn't watching football. You know, Monday I was already into the work week, so I wasn't really watching Monday Night Football. I didn't know any of the players. I was like, that'll tell me, you know, the commitment is that, you know, so much time had passed and that's all I was doing was learning my lines and doing the scenes, so. Kimberly, when you made the decision to step away from General Hospital, you were going to be a director and you were going to do your life or I don't know which came which first, but were you pretty much like I, you'd pop back in whenever, but you knew you wanted to move on now? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had, I think my first movie I made was when I was 16 starring Vanessa Marcel. <laughs> <laughs> it was called heaven. With Vanessa um, Marcel. Yeah. In order to do the Robin and Stone story, I actually deferred a year from NYU. I had gotten into the acting program at Tisch That's and funny. I went through that whole storyline I deferred a year and at the end of the year I said I'm done with acting and I applied to the film school and I got in the film school and then that's when I left the show um but wait I want to tell you guys something that was kind of full circle that just happened so I don't know if you remember this Michael but um Francesca actually that day the day of Stone's death she told me that she had a gift for me and it was this dress that was a, a family heirloom. And she was like, just keep it for a special occasion, right? That's I was like, okay. So I got nominated for an Emmy and I wore the dress and I thought, I hope I win because I would feel really bad if I wore it and it wasn't like a special occasion. It wasn't special enough. Thank you. I, I really want to thank God, first of all, for blessing me with the opportunity to touch so many people's hearts and open their eyes. And I would also like to thank Wendy Rich for having the courage to tell this beautiful story, Claire for writing it, Michael Bruno, my buddy. I would also like to thank all the people that have been with me over the years, Fanola Hughes, Tristan Rogers, Jack Wagner, Ian Buchanan. I love you and will always remember you. I would like to thank Marty Vats for always making sure that I made it to my finals. I would like to thank a man who changed my life, Mr. John Homa, who taught me how to trust myself. And I would also like to thank my mother, whose love and support I would not be here without. I love you more than anything, Mom. Anyway, so I've kept this dress. It was the dress that I won the Emmy in. And I gave it to this young woman that I'm working with, Olivia Rodrigo. And she is wearing the dress on um, Good Morning America on Thursday, singing a song. And I 
tripped out. Like, it's so weird. We're the exact same age. Wow. She like put the dress on, like fit like a glove. Like it did, she didn't alter it. It was just, it was just so cool to be able to like, I, I don't, I don't think that she understands how much that means. Right. Like at the time I didn't understand how much that meant. Right. And it's only like in the passing on that, you know, I'm passing on this sort of like legacy, you know, that yeah. we, that we had, that we created it together. It's pretty cool. It's funny when you say legacy, you want to know when you talk about what Tony Gurry before, I always got the impression, I don't know, Kimberly, if you did as well, but I kind of felt that he knew that Robin and Stone was the next Luke and Laura. What is the uh, project that she's on Good Morning America? What is the show you said? Oh, it's the show that I'm producing and directing right now called High School Musical, the series. That's right. And they're promoting the, um, the holiday special that's airing on Disney Plus on the 11th. Fantastic. That's fantastic. So, so now that you've been Miss Director for a while, are you, do you, are you like, this is my thing? Like, do you, are you loving it? Are you now? What yeah, I, I absolutely love it. It's, it's hard in COVID because I, you know, I have to wear a mask and a shield and I can't really see anybody and, you know. <laughs> and you're directing. This is the first time I've had my hoops on in a year because they get caught in the mask. Um, oh my gosh. But yeah, I mean, it's a blast. Yeah, I'm having a, a lot of fun. And you do a lot of sitcoms too. You've been doing- I did, yeah, I did. Been, one Day at a Time and Connors you did, right? Yeah, and then um, Carol's Second Act and what's that other one that I did? Cool Kids and yeah, I like, I like doing that too, um, which is like very similar to how we shot General Hospital. Michael, what are you, what do you know, people want to know, would you want to tell them what you're doing now at all or what you've been up to or? Well, sure. Um, you know, I got really into uh, real estate. Um, so I have my license. I'm doing like luxury real estate in Beverly Hills and Sunset Strip area, Brentwood, Santa Monica, Palisades, this whole like West Side area. I love it. Uh, we started a little fund as well to kind of redo houses and, um, you know, like a design build. Um, but what is kind of interesting is I got into this PPE procurement. And so I'm on all these phone calls every day trying to get hospitals and different hedge funds and institutions masks and gloves and things like that, which is a trip. Um, and about a month and a half ago, one of the ladies who was sort of procuring this stuff with us, she's a former frontline hospital worker, you know, said she was a Robin and Stone fan, love Maurice Bernard, Sonny, and I got Sonny, I got Maurice to in character, leave a, 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 an audio and, and actually a, a clip. He did a, he did a clip for her saying how great that what she was doing was so special and keep it up and how amazing it is that she's on the front line. And it was, uh, it was pretty remarkable to see. She just was floored that someone that she looked up to actually said thank you to her. And it was, oh. cool. well, I'm, I'm doing that right now because everything's sort of on a standstill. So that's the one kind of business that's like thriving. Yeah, I heard. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. That's amazing, Michael. Trip. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So Kimberly, how's motherhood? Your fans are like, just how's Kimberly and her kid? It's great. It's in, it's insane. But it's, you know, it's the ultimate um heartbreaker. You know, like I, I heard people say, like when you have a kid, it's like your heart is living outside of your body. And it's that's exactly what it is. Um you know, thankfully I have an amazing partner who helps me because I had a baby and a career at the same time. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm enjoying it. He's growing up too fast. I, I'm still been, you know, it's hard for me to wrap around because like I knew Kimberly when she was like nine. So I'm like, what? She's a mom now? You know, it's just, hard, you know. I am such a mom. Like I'm like an mom. oh my mom. Like I wear... When I'm not working, I wear like Birkenstocks and then like to dress up, I wear clogs. Like I'm like a mom. Your mom. I have Your many mom. snacks in my purse. 
And he, he is o Otis, right? Otis, yeah. Is, is three and a half? He's three and a half, yeah. Three and a half. And you Otis. Otis. After Otis Redding, my favorite singer. Kimberly, what do you remember the day when obviously, you know, you were on social media and you made that statement and you saw a lot of love coming back to you. And what I wanted to say is you see that, right? You guys like the love yes. that comes back. It's just, I, 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 it makes me just choke up when I yes. saw it. Thank you for bringing that up, honestly, because um, I've like several times gone back to that post and read the comments and um it's weird. Like I said, it's, it's like cathartic. It may, it makes me cry. I can also like feel the connection from all of these people. I love the stories about, I thought it was so funny about, um, that's the, uh, I, I've seen this many times. Um, that was the only day my mom let me come home early from school, right. um, and, and watch it. Or I remember where I was when I watched it. I remember who I watched it with. Um, some people even said their teachers talked about it at school the next day. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing because now that we have social media, we have this like immediate feedback. Whereas back then, like I said, we'd only hear about this stuff if we went to the grocery store and someone stopped us right. or there was fan mail, but you know, it's just not as. It, 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 immediate. Immediate. It's not yeah. immediate and you can see it and it can, it's all there. Michael, you did too. You put a, a beautiful post. It's so funny. You posted the poster and then I posted my poster, which <laughs> I have the poster right in my office of the two of you, which has been in here. Like I look at it every day. That's um, crazy. I, I, mean, I mean, I look at it every day. I've had it up here for 20 some years. 20 some years. Love Do you remember never, being at that shoot, Michael? It was like in Malibu and they brought out those big frames and just stuck them in the middle of the rocks. Yep, yep, yep. I did. I remember, like you were saying, I remember it vividly. Uh, the, the scenes, what led up to it, what was going on around. It was, uh, we were connected in that space and that's why we, we just can place us back then and there. Uh, and even going back to the set, like the soundstage, it was remarkable. It was almost like no time had passed, you know? It was like, it's like, I knew that once I got up to that stage, this was what was going to happen. And um, you could just, uh, you could feel it. It was, we're, our presence is still there, so to speak. Or we're, we're karmically still, you know, <laughs> we're still there. Yeah. Kimberly, when you had to do the well scene and he came back, do you remember going, were you like, now I know you because I, I, I know you. So were you like, were you excited this was going to happen? Or were you like, how are they going to make this work? Or were you trepidatious about it? Oh, I was so excited. I was so excited. Um, you know, Michael will always be this like anchor for me. And that that's how I experienced it that day was like, Oh, I just have to, I just have to hook in. That's it. That's all I have to do. I just have to be available for the like click. And then it was just all amazing. Ditto. I feel the same way. So it was, it was, you just clicked in. That's right. Was there a scene in the, in the arc of the AIDS storyline in the HIV storyline for either of you that was the hardest moment to play? Was it the end or was something else more difficult moment to do? Do you remember anything that sticks out to you that you were really having a hard time in in the story doing? Or was most challenging? Go, Michael, you first. <laughs> well, for me, it first of all, it was the, the just being able to get to that level for the material. So as the storyline went on and I got more comfortable, I, I, I got better. Um, what threw me was when we were doing the documentary and meeting the AIDS patients themselves and you know, hearing you know, these stories from people that were our age and our contemporaries having to really deal with this. And I think you know, in the documentary, I think Kimberly and I both were on camera saying, you know, we almost, it's almost too much for us to do the documentary in a way because we felt like we were cheating them that were really going through it and suffering. And then Kimberly and I somehow got that, okay, 
they are to us what we need to be for the audience and the viewer and we are them. And as soon as that click happened and we realized how important it was, it was no longer, I don't wanna be the poster child for anything. It was like, I'm the poster child, tell this story through me. We are gonna break down these walls. The minority is not gonna be unheard for any longer. We're gonna tell this the right way and we're gonna overcome this obstacle. It's a human interest piece. It wasn't a disease anymore. And that's why I compare it to Black Lives Matter because if you're the oppressed, you're never gonna get anywhere until the people that are the majority say enough's enough and contain their own and say, that's ridiculous. Who's putting up with this anymore? It's gonna change. And that's when change happens. You can't be the one who's being bullied and expect something to happen and make it be enough. The majority has to realize that they need to stop and police their own, so to speak, and make a difference. And so I think we knew it and we knew it and that's why we did it and that's why we committed and that's why we love, you know, the, the Wendy Riches and all the directors and Francesca and you name it because it mattered and they all were there when it mattered. So well said, so well said, yeah. Do you have anything to add on that, Kimberly? Because he kind of... No, you, you no, you always <laughs> that question. He always encapsulates. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of that, you did have Claire Levine, Wendy. I mean, you really had the team. Francesca, I mean, you look back, I, I, I don't think, again, going back to that time period, you had the heavyweights there. You had the people that could tell this kind of emotional heart, compelling story and hook it into the audience, make it palpable, like Michael was saying, for the mainstream and do it. I mean, you had the, it's almost like a dream team. Um, you probably look back on it now and realize that, but maybe did not realize it then? Did you know back then? I did, I, I realized it was the A-team. And I, I loved how they, speaking about Claire and Wendy specifically, I loved how they um, challenged us every day, um, especially with Claire. It was like, I'm gonna take really, really good care of these words and now it's your job to continue taking very, very good care of these words. So it was just like the passing of the baton. And like Michael was saying, we were so young. So it was scary, but they definitely didn't treat it lightly. They weren't like, well, see what you can do. They were like, this is important. Don't F it up. <laughs> right. right. We, had, we had the UCLA Health Center. We had the doctors that were consultants. So, we, you know, we, we were saying these, you know, enormously long words, <laughs> you know, the drugs and everything else. I mean, I can remember some of them, but you know, it was a mouthful of stuff. So we were, it, it was a new vernacular, uh, new emotional curve. It was all those things wrapped into one. And um, we had the support, but it still meant we had to get there, you know? So doing the documentary was amazing. Having the acting coaches was amazing. Having the writers and the consultants and you know, all those things led it to finally click for us. And then, and then we just took off. At some point, we just, we, we were having fun with it because we didn't have to second guess how our choices were being perceived. I mean, for me, that was the biggest thing is that the choices were correct. Once I knew the choices were correct, oh, then I was, then I was going. And Kimberly, you know, she was a veteran. I was the new actor. She was, you know, acting since she was a child. So she was already you know, at a, at a level that was, you know, amazing. I had to catch up to her and then I had to confide in her. And then we, you know, then we locked in and told something beautiful, full of love and all the things that she, she spoke about. So it's something okay, I'm- Okay, I had to, I had to catch up to your maturity. So we're, we're even. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not right. I do remember what was the, what was the man that was playing, he was playing a character on our show, but he really had AIDS in real life. Oh yeah. Oh uh, yeah. I don't remember his name, but right. Of course I remember the scene. Yeah, but I remember that moment and I, cause I wasn't in the scene and I was downstairs in my dressing room and I was watching it. And there was a point where you couldn't continue because All right. yeah, there was something going on. You were talking to him yeah. and you're just like, this is not right. I, I, don't, I, I don't, I don't know how to do this, this scene. Yeah. And I think it, it was in the, the special too. Do you remember what happened in your mind? There, like, so there was two things that were upsetting to me. 
one in the documentary when we went to go visit somebody at the hospice that was going to be our second interview with them. And then on camera, they tell us that that person had passed. Yeah, was that was so violating, felt I violated and upset. I was like, don't do that to us. I don't want to be a guinea pig of my emotions out there. Yeah. I'm like, this isn't the show. This yeah. isn't the general hospital show. And they're like, no, this is the show. You're on a reality show. Oh. And we want to capture that moment, the aha moment on tape. Oh. And I, I felt like that was not theirs to see. I was like, that's my private moment. Yeah. But that was part of it. That was, and then I was like, all right, I guess that's what we signed up for. But I was like, God, they could have told us that he passed. And then when we go that, I don't know. It, it, not only did they not tell us that he passed, they told me like, you're going to go read to him today. And oh, they were like, what wow. are you reading to him? So it was manipulative and everything. Oh, it was manipulative. Fake. It was so many, yeah. Right. So that's where I felt, and, and we were already exhausted and we already felt overwhelmed and all the pressure. But in that scene, so it was to piggyback off that moment with the documentary was, I was looking at this guy who's, basically knows he's dying and you know he's in a scene documenting you know on a soap opera something that you know his life's ending you know we're tell we're portraying a story but his life is ending and I was like yeah we're trying to do well and right by everybody but my god this is not we're not in it's apples and oranges and that's why I had to pull out of the scene I was like my god because I was starting to believe in my own head okay I'm in the moment and I'm portraying this character as if I was dying of AIDS. And I'm like, no, I'm not. And I know I'm not. And I don't want to cheat him of his moment and his life. And I'm not parallel with that. I, I was like, I got to stop the scene for a minute. It's really horrible. And I just can't explain to people the vacuum you feel. The day that I met with the group of guys who were HIV positive, there was one guy who basically was heterosexual and became HIV positive, and the other two were gay. Kimberly, you know, you had, Robin went on after Stone died, and there were so many nurses' balls, and she would make the speech, and it was always back to Stone's death. What did you feel about, you know, they would have Robin come out, and she'd say the speech, and you'd have to go back to that place, and you'd have to, you know, were those hard to do, or were you, what, or were you not? Or oh my you, God, the speeches. The speeches. <laughs> memorializing stone <laughs> all the time yeah i mean it, it was such a um it was interesting because it was yes it was our storyline but all of the other actors were affected in some way or they were compelled by it or they were moved by it and so what would happen is like i'd be standing there trying to give the speech and the second i'd like look at someone they would just start like bawling because <laughs> like because they remembered Stone, you know, it, it, like it all meant so much to us. So they were just kind of hard to get through because I mean, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's really weird. Like I never experienced that again on General Hospital. There was just that character, that Stone that just really affected everybody, whether you were part of the storyline or not. And I, and Michael, that is so true. Again, what happened on social media is like Stone, Stone. I talk to people who, you know, they know I, I do soap opera, I work in soap operas, but even they were like, oh, Stone, like they know it. Right. It is part of, it is part of culture. Yeah. TV I, yeah. I, I was, you know, after the soap opera, I really segued into a whole new profession. I was doing like restaurants and nightclubs and food and beverage and got into that in a big way. Right. And, uh, had my own restaurants and nightclubs and whatnot. So I would always be interacting with people socially and they would tell me like oh you were on the show today and i was like what do you mean i was on the show today i didn't really understand how often they kept bringing the stone reference or even clips up and you know i was busy doing my own stuff and not really paying attention but you know it, it was quite often over the years that they would reintroduce that so i loved that they kept the legacy going and the commitment to it and you do realize we're part of, you know, a, a decades long TV show and it's all rel relative and related and it all is intertwined. And we're, we're it's like a, it's like a play in that sense where we're, we're a character in the overlying theme of this forever. So when I was like, they're committed to it, I felt so proud that they were committed to it. It was, it really, it was significant to me that they kept it up. I was happy to hear that, you know? Kimberly, did Fanola ever say anything to you about your acting in those scenes? In the 
did she ever talk to you about it or? You know, Fanola is, um, gosh, I don't even know how to say it. She's like the greatest communicator, but she's not very emotional. She's British, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, she is. Yeah. So she's, she's really, really good at letting me know how proud she is of me and when I'm doing something great, but she doesn't, she doesn't overdo it, which I, which I like, like, I always know if she's saying something is good, then it's pretty damn good. So will you show Otis when he's old enough? Will you show him the story? How proud? Oh God, I don't know. He's so sensitive. I think it would just make him cry. <laughs> But how great mommy was, you know, like mom was this iconic character and, you know, I wonder what that would be like when he understands. Yeah, that's so funny. I feel like that's so far in the future. I hadn't even thought of it. But what I do think is interesting when they had the, um, it was like the best of soap opera moments, some special that aired. The Yes, I, I know, because uh, the one on ABC was earlier this year. Yeah, and, yeah. and I was like, at first, I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. And I thought to myself, gosh, no one even asked to interview me. Okay, whatever. So I kind of had an attitude about it. And then I was like, well, I'm curious. I need to watch it. And I, did you see it, Michael? I did. I did. The story of Soap. On Robin and Stone, like this, right. like the longest segment. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, yeah. I am a part of it. It's so cool. Like, look at, there we are. Like 16, I was 17 or something. Yeah, it's so funny. Every time I've worked on the daytime Emmys, we do like the social issues package. It'll be Robin and Stone. I did the 55 years of General Hostel package. I put Robin Stone. We were always trying to like, when the producers and I were talking, they're like, could we stick in some more shots of Robin and Stone? You know, we were trying to, you know, encapsulate 55 years of the show and you want to, and I had to like put it all together and you get two and a half minutes. I'm like, how am I going to do this? Yeah. Which was, was the most daunting task I've ever been charged with to tell general hospital history in two and a half minutes yeah that's scary it was scary and awful <laughs> it was scary and awful because you know something got left you know there was just i was fighting for things to be in but it was always how do you talk about all the power couples like you, you can't can i mean you, like, it was, I montage 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 right. stone die <laughs> you know it's just like it was difficult but the point is every time there's an emmys there's a package anything big it's robin and stoner obviously it is it is part of tv history and iconic and so i cool. i just want to say i you guys should be so proud as you've already talked about but just beautiful work it holds up today it holds up it holds up you can go right back to it you should be so proud of what you've done and how much this means to people it means so much to so many people and the lives you've touched i cannot even tell you because I, I've been in touch with these people for 30 some 40 years, you know, and you, you've touched them in a way that is so profound that is seldom seen. Like you seldom, it's rare, it's rare, but the story did transcend. Thank you. I, I hope you take that with you and I'm sure you do like, yeah, you know. And Kimberly, thank you. It thank was you. special, it's, it's gonna remain special, you know. It, it, the soap operas, there's only so much that you can tell it's interesting, but it doesn't have the, gravitas that that storyline had so yeah you know, you know i don't know what are the other comparable storylines that was really like that there's a handful so we're one of a handful we rose to the top <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you michael for um bringing us together um especially because it's the 25th anniversary you said yeah wow i couldn't let it go by without seeing both of you and talking to you because you've all, you know, we've all been a part of each other's lives too. And um, I wanted to mark it. I think as I get older and as we get older, you know, all these things become more precious to us and you don't want things to go by without connecting with the people and letting them know that you miss them or, or how profound uh, you, they've impacted your life. You're such a lovely person. And I, I miss you both. I, I really miss you do. too. I miss you <laughs> too, for sure. What a pleasure it was to talk to you both. So good to see you. Thank you both. And uh, hopefully next year or soon, we can all physically see each other in the same room. 
which would be wonderful. And please stay well and stay safe and have a happy holiday. And um, I'll leave it at that. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye guys. Bye.